Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be talking about ARPANET and how it led to the development of the internet. So some quotes from visionaries who sometimes get things wrong. It happens to all of us. In 1943, Thomas J. Watson said, I think there is a, a world market for about five computers. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, I think we're well past that. Uh, also, an editor for Prentice Hall in 1957 said, I can assure you from the highest authority that data processing is a fad. It won't last out the year. Yeah, I would say prophetically wrong <laughs> on that one as well. Ken Olson's famous, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. Yeah, that was in 1977, and it was only a year later he was proven wrong. So up until this point, though, uh, by the time we got into the early 1960s, the computers were standalone. Some of them had communications. Yeah, it was slow. It was, it was terrible. The start of all of this is that if you work on your computer and I work on my computer, and you and I have to solve a problem together. Wouldn't it be nice if my computer was connected to your computer? And what they were trying to do was come up with a standard way in order for communications to occur uh, across a network that could be shared. So the first pa switch packet network was initiated in 1966, and it wasn't until 1969 that they actually made a connection between any of these computers, and that was called the ARPANET. Uh, don't confuse it with the Internet. It was nothing like the Internet. The first director of the Information Processing Techniques Office at the Pentagon's ARPA used the term intergalactic uh, computer network. And, he, and uh, JCR uh, Licklider did that because... He knew that engineers would always undeliver and disappoint him. So he set the, loft, the goals lofty. Let's make it an intergalactic network, which is probably all not all that far-fetched today. He said he, he, uh, he envisioned a network which was open to everyone. That would be governments, institutions, corporations, and individuals. And that could be shared. It could transmit information, documents, videos, audio. He foresaw everything that is currently going on today, and this would have been around 1960 when he wrote his famous paper. So in 1965, Donald Davies, a Welsh computer scientist who was working for the National Physical Laboratories over in the UK, conceived the idea of packet switching as a, a mechanism by which you could create reliable networks. Reliable networks meaning that I would not transmit the whole message, but just parts of the message, and then uh, check them at each end to make sure that they were sent correctly, and then send the next, the next, the next packet until you reassembled the whole message at the other end. But Davies proposed a national data network in the United Kingdom. So he designed and built the NPL network uh, to demonstrate this technology. ARPANET really credits his influence with the basis for their design of the ARPANET. Charles Hurstfield was another visionary. He was an American scientist that was, uh, that was associated particularly with the U.S. government. He was best known as the director of DARPA, and he, who approved the creation of the ARPANET. So it was Charles Hurstfield's vision that really allowed the ARPANET to move forward. Bob Taylor was also a director of ARPA's Information Processing Office from 1965 through 1969. So he was really instrumental in getting ARPANET launched, getting it started. There was a lot of years where it took some time for, for the, the researchers and the, the engineers to figure out how they were going to approach this problem. So it was really Bob Taylor that was really responsible for that. Now, now uh, Bob Taylor went on to found Xerox Park's Computer Science Laboratory, and that was the famous laboratory that produced the Xerox Alto and, the, and uh, later the Xerox Star. Bob Taylor had his hand in the networks. He had his hand in 
uh, the uh, generation of the user interfaces that we use today. He also went on to found De uh, Digital Equipment Corporation's Research Center. Bob Kahn is really, with Bob Taylor, is really said to be the two, uh, the two co-conspirators for the ARPANET, because without these two gentlemen, nothing probably would have happened. He was an electrical engineer who, along with Vint Cerf, now Vint was a member of faculty at, I believe, UCLA, and so he first proposed the transmission control protocol and the subsequent internet protocol that accompanied it. The summer of 1968, uh, DARPA actually put out a request for quotations, RFQ, asking for proposals to build a four-node packet switch net. So a lot of the ideas that I've been working on were embedded in that RFQ. There's an invention that Khan triggered, and he and Vint Cerf made it together, and that's the internet protocols, without which nothing would work, and with it, just about everything works. It was, I think, the single largest engineering invention of the 20th century. Steve Crocker was a graduate student at UCLA. Steve was part of the team that developed the protocols to create TCP IP, uh, and also other protocols that came along for the ARPANET. There was all kinds of standards that were written. Uh, and those, he organized the network working groups. He became the Internet, uh, which later became the Internet Engineering Task Force. And he also initiated the Request for Comment series. Or if you don't know what Request for Comment is, this is how standards are adopted by the Internet ta uh, Engineering Task Force. At the beginning of 1969, they started to build this uh, network, and the first node was going to be at UCLA in September 1969. Graduate students and the other staff members got together, called together in one meeting, and then we uh, initiated a series of meetings ourselves to um, sketch out what to do with this network. That led to the creation of a set of documents which uh, we uh, called uh, Request for Comments uh, as a deliberate ploy to uh, make it clear that the door was open, but they were in fact the way in which we documented the designs and the standards that we had come up with. Steve Crocker was one of a small team who installed the first imp, that is, got it running. I was in the group that was getting favored with this uh, present, if you will. It was a sort of uh, uh, a gift from on high that uh, couldn't be refused. You're going to be connected. The first connection over the ARPANET happened after I was gone. Steve Lukasik called me and said, we connected. It, it failed, it, it disconnected right away, but I said, well, that's what it's like to be first on the block. This is really working. Now, not that this is, this is good if it worked. <laughs> This is really working. The youngest guy in our group, Charlie Klein, was uh, given the task of sitting down and typing the, the characters. And he, typed, uh, he tried to type login, L-O-G-I-N, as the initiation. And after two or three characters, the connection died and all the software broke. And we had to go back to the uh, drawing board. The other problem that the ARPANET team faced was politics. <laughs> Not politics from the government, but politics from the computer vendors. They all wanted to do it their way. This team wanted to get rid of the politics, and so they created the interface message processor, and that would control how communications would occur through the packet switch network, and they would have the connection interfaces that would go to the individual systems. The request for comment system uh, was initiated, of course, by Steve Crocker, as I had said, but the RFC is really a publication in a series for the development of standards. So if you have a standard, if you have a new use for the internet, you can write a request for comment and send it to the engin Internet Engineering Task Force, and they will put it out for review, and people will make comments on it and propose changes, and eventually it gets adopted and it becomes part of the standards. As of March, as of now, March 2023, there are 9,367 RFCs for, uh, for the Internet Engineering Task Force. Quite a few. This is a warning from the visionaries about, and I'm just going to let them tell you in their own words. I, I guess my philosophy of, of engineering can be some and, and science and things is is can be summarized by say I 
I believe in doing radical new things, but carrying them out in a very conservative way. What we call a computer today will be a network of communicating, let's say, subcomputers. So there will be some other words for them. Um, a lot of them will be portable. They'll be carried in the pocket. They'll be on hand when you need them. The, one of the real hazards is that if people keep depending upon new technology coming in that's satisfying the perceived needs of today or tomorrow, that this does inch you up in improving and sort of like you're climbing a hill of improvement. But the thing about this new frontier is there are lots of hills and there's some of them are going to be much bigger and you actually might keep on improving until you come to the top of the hill you're working on and you look around and says, oh my god, there's another hill over there we should have been on going up. You don't, you don't find these different hills by doing that incremental hill climbing. It takes, you, you gotta explore. I, I hope you enjoyed this, this look today. If you did, please like and subscribe and hope to see you all again real soon. Bye for now.